I started this journey chasing one ghost and ended up taking a lesson from another. We humans defend the things we value, but how can we care about something we barely know? That's the question I needed to answer. That's why I traveled halfway across the country looking for a bee. I can't remember what first attracted me to insects. I was always shy, and I wasn't very good at sports or other socially acceptable things. I was the kid who was good at science and art. And even though I've got kids of my own now, not much has changed. I've been training all my life for this. That's why I'm still dressed like a 10-year-old boy. My name is Clay Bolt. I'm a nature photographer, and my favorite subjects in the world are the little animals that most people ignore. Like everyone else, I had heard about the sudden die-off of honeybees. So one day, I went looking for bees near my home in South Carolina. I found some gorgeous little bees that didn't look much like honeybees, but I had no idea what they were. I did some reading and discovered that there are almost 4,000 species of wild, native bees in North America. Honeybees, the ones everyone is so worried about, actually don't belong here. Europeans brought them over with cows and chickens and all of our other domesticated animals. We knew almost nothing about most of the native species, and so photographing native bees became my obsession. I wanted to figure out which bee species I'd photographed, so I went to visit the research collections at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Becky Nichols, the park entomologist, wanted to make sure I also saw the bumblebees, one species in particular. The rusty patch bumblebee has not been seen in the park since 2003, despite repeated efforts to find it. We do have records of it occurring all the way back to the 1930s, and so we're not entirely sure why we're seeing the decline, especially in a protected area like the National Park. Looking at this desiccated bumblebee impaled on a pin, it was hard to believe that something so amazing could just vanish. There was a stuffed passenger pigeon next to me, sort of staring off into space with its glass eyes. That was the most numerous bird on the continent, but we exterminated it before we even realized what we were doing. I wondered whether the rusty patched bumblebee, like the passenger pigeon, was another ghost in the making. It had disappeared from most of the east in a little more than a decade, Yet most people had no idea it was ever here. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I saw a post on a bee listserv that gave me hope and sent me up to Virginia to meet Ty Ralston. So last year, we had traps set up at 17 different fields throughout this region. And the overall program is designed to you know, understand what influences bee populations. And then one day I just saw one with a little bit of a rusty, bright rusty patch on it. And I just kind of looked and said, I want to take a look at that one. You know, called up Sam Drogi and said, Sam, you know, I think I've got it. And I sent him a picture and he said, it certainly looks like Mamba Safinus. And he said, that'll, that'll be big news. <laughs> um, I got it and indeed was that species. And we took a whole series of pictures of it because it was a big deal to find um, that bumblebee. So, you know, we're just hoping for more. What this one specimen means is really a big question. You know, it's possible that, you know, this is one of the last little populations of a species that's going away. And it's possible that there are areas out there where the species is doing, is doing okay. You know, we have gone back to the same site uh, on two occasions with a crew of eight to 10 people and uh, we've not been able to find it again, unfortunately. At the U.S. Geological Survey in Maryland, Sam Drogi was capturing these amazing, detailed images of specimens in museums to help other researchers identify bees. But you don't have to be an entomologist to think these pictures are just awesome. The pictures are very similar to the shots that you see from the Hubble telescope. We knew beforehand what a star looked like. It was a tiny little dot at night, and we all had that same experience. 
Everyone knows what a bee is, and they have a mind picture of something that looks kind of like a honeybee, maybe a little more colorful, and then you show them these pictures, and there are green bees, and there are blue bees, and there's you know iridescence and stripes and large ones and tiny ones. One of my daughters Facebooked me and said, Papa, I think someone has stolen your pictures. And she gave me a link to Reddit, and they, indeed, they had stolen it, but we allow people to steal the pictures, right? So um, they linked it back to the Whoa Dude subreddit, which is the stoner subreddit. Why was my daughter looking at the stoner subreddit? I don't know. In two days, like 200,000 views. As a photographer, I might have been a little jealous of the attention that Sam's images got. But I also realized that I was adding something new by photographing living bees in their environment. I had a few thousand species to choose from, but the rusty-patched bumblebee was at the top of my list. I needed to find out what had happened to these bees and where I could still find them. And Sydney Cameron at the University of Illinois had some evidence of what might be going on. Not all species of bumblebees are declining in the United States. The rusty patch bumblebee has undergone probably the most serious decline. And we know that because we went back to the historical collections that museums maintain, which are incredibly valuable for doing work like this. You compare the historical with the current, we're able to get the relative distributions and abundances of bees over the last hundred years. When bees, commercial bumblebees, are put into greenhouses, potentially with whatever parasites or diseases they might have, they come and go through the vents. It was hypothesized that a pathogen was introduced from Europe via uh, American bees being contaminated in European facilities, a pathogen known as Nosema bombi. The conclusions that we drew from the screening of Nosema was that indeed there was a very significant correlation between the declining species and the high prevalence of Nosema bombi. With every single thing you do, the universe is split in two. With every single choice you make. I went to see some greenhouse bumblebees, and it was so obvious that they were different. They were technically Bombus impatiens, which is a common wild species, but these commercial bees had no fight left in them. Who knows, maybe they were carrying Nosema. Either way, if these bees made contact with the bumblebees outside, it's hard to imagine there wouldn't be consequences for the wild ones. The commercial industry is doing a service by growing bumblebees, an important service. However, if I say, look, you cannot ship or should not ship outside the native region of a species, well, why not? Well, because it could be carrying parasites. Well, then you have to prove that. And that's a, that's a big effort. That may take my entire career to prove. In the meanwhile, these guys are still shipping bees all around the world. <laughs> on the one hand, you have a multi-million dollar industry. And on the other, an insect that most people don't even notice. If Nosema is causing the bees' decline, then their best hope is to develop resistance to the disease. And they can only do that if they have time. There are still some rusty patch bumblebee populations in the upper Midwest. And whether I could photograph them or not, I needed to know they were still out there. A bee biologist named Rich Hatfield suggested that we meet up in Madison, Wisconsin to try and find the bee. This is a species that used to be one of the most common um, bumblebees in the eastern United States. And now its relative abundance has dropped by 90 to 95 percent. So a once common animal has become incredibly rare. In February of 2013, the Xerces Society filed a petition with the Fish and Wildlife Service to have the rusty patch bumblebee listed as an endangered species. And under the law, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has to reply within 90 days with what's called a 90-day finding. They just have to respond and say, this species warrants a, a further investigation by the Fish and Wildlife Service, or it doesn't. 
When I met up with Rich, more than 900 days after the petition was filed, there still hadn't been a 90-day finding on the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. If the agency responsible for endangered species couldn't be bothered to respond, then the bee was going to need some other allies. If I could photograph the bee, then at least people could see what we stood to lose. Thanks to Susan Carpenter, I found my first rusty patch bumblebee at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum. A living, flying bee moving around a healthy landscape. Rich had his first live sighting too, after advocating for this species for years. I'm almost haunted by the thought that these insects have no idea that they're some of the last of their kind. They're just doing what they do, making a living like they've done for thousands of years. See, the thing is, most people don't realize that male bumblebees don't sting, so it's like you've got superpowers. Bird power. There are at least seven other common bumblebee species living in the Arboretum, and I wondered if I would recognize a rusty patch if I saw one. But soon, I didn't even need to see the rusty mark to know when I was looking at the right bee. The way it moves, the way it feeds, they're just a little different. Different enough that the ecosystem would know if the rusty patch bumblebee were missing. I photographed the rusty patch feeding and flying and resting for the night. One of the really special moments, even though it's not the best photo I got, was finding a gyne, one of next year's queens, like a fuzzy little symbol of hope for the future. I couldn't leave Wisconsin without visiting Aldo Leopold's shack. As I got to know the rusty patched bumblebee, I kept thinking about his words. Leopold wrote, One of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on land is quite invisible to laymen. Before coming to Wisconsin, I was a layman. I didn't know the bee, and I couldn't possibly understand the gap it would leave if it disappeared. But now, I'm troubled by the prospect of a world without it, even if I can't quite articulate why. What good are insects to start with? Uh, you can answer that question in a couple of different ways. One is you can try to figure out what good are they doing for me? You know, what is the value of that biodiversity? I think we can all agree that having zero species probably is not a good uh, situation to have. Having lots of species, well, is that better than just having a few? There was a very interesting and provocative paper that came out uh, just recently that in fact looked at the contribution of bee diversity to pollination returns. And what they found was that it's actually not bee diversity per se that is important, but it's just a core group of species, common bee species, that do most of the crop pollination. So if we take that economic argument again, what is the value of all those other species that don't seem to be getting you an economic return? In theory, they're worth zero, and we shouldn't be conserving them. The rusty patch bumblebee might well have been one of those economically valuable bees. And if its populations recover, maybe it will be again. But I don't think dollars and cents are the only reason to care about a species. On the one hand, I completely understand that it's difficult to value something that it seems so detached uh, from, from our everyday lives. On the other hand, if you don't need to put that value on it, that also says something about how you value other life in general. And I'll never forget the first time I put 
a beetle under the microscope and looked at it up close. And I thought, these are the most beautiful things that I've ever seen. That was good enough for me. I didn't need to put any value on it. They were just beautiful. If you ask kids to name a bee, they will, they will say honeybees. If you ask them to draw a bee, almost every single time they draw a bumblebee. Sometimes they think they're drawing a honeybee, but they draw it black and yellow and kind of fat. You know, they, they draw bumblebees. I live in the middle of Winchester, Virginia, the biggest town in, you know, 40 mile radius. And I've got four species of bumblebees in my backyard. So we are all in it together, supporting those populations. Bumblebees and other pollinators really need three things. They need flowers, they need a safe place to build their nest, and they need a pesticide-free environment. And as long as you can provide those things, it's truly a build it and they will come scenario. If you build habitat, pollinators will show up. We spend so much time and effort making life better for ourselves. The least that we can do is make life possible for this bee. What will it take to save this species? When your life is finished burning, it won't be effortless, but we're talking about the existence of a species. People everywhere share a desire to feel wonder. We gravitate toward rare, beautiful things. And we've got one right here. The rusty-patched bumblebee really is an amazing little animal. When you get to know them, all species are. That's what gives me hope. Leopold said, our ability to perceive quality in nature begins, as in art, with the pretty. It expands through successive stages of the beautiful to values as yet uncaptured by language. Do we have it in us to save the rusty-patched bumblebee? I think we do.